lists are the only options for people to choose. So people can kind of choose. Julius, I am the coordinator of this session. I am a research associate of the Cornell Center for Social Sciences. I manage our center's resource reproduction service, which verifies and certifies the reproducibility of our researchers' studies prior to submitting them for publication. I'm also the co-founder of the Curating for Reproducibility Consortium, or CURE, along with uh, Limor Peer of Yale and Kumai Lewis of the University of North Carolina. Together, we co-chair the RDA's CURE Fair Working Group. Thus, this session is very dear and near to me, and you are here because you are either practicing, interested, or curious about research reproducibility. Thank you to the program committee for the excellent job in selecting the papers for this session. Not only are the papers on point, they also reflect the I in ISIS, which stands for international. From the Netherlands, we have a presentation about a reproducibility hackathon where researchers learn and improve their reproducibility skills and get feedback for their efforts. From Canada, we have a presentation about concrete and actionable steps to help improve our understanding and practice of computational reproducibility. And from the United States, we have a presentation about errors that authors commonly make in replication packages and challenges faced by authors in making their research reproducible. Before we begin, let me just remind you to mute your mics. Please type your questions in the chat or Q&A box. At the end of each presentation, I will read a question about the presentation from the audience while the next presenter is setting up. Then after the last presentation, I will open the floor for Q&A. We will end the session around 1.55 p.m. Eastern time. So you have time for a quick break before hopping off to the next session. So let's begin. Our first presenter is Dr. Christina Hetna, Digital Scholarship Librarian, Leiden University Libraries. The title of our presentation is Reprohack NL 2019, Enhancing Research Reproducibility at Dutch Universities. Christina is an expert on fair data management and open access with a background in data science, research reproducibility, and bioinformatics. She has facilitated many workshops related to reproducible science, such as the creation of fair metadata and repo hacks, regularly advises researcher on open science, and is an active participant in international networks, such as the RDA and GoFair. She is an author of more than 40 research publications. Christina? Thank you. Let me see. I will start by uh, sharing my screen. So let me say that it's it's really great to be here today. It's my first ISIST, and um, I haven't been in the library world uh, so long, just uh, about two and a half years. And um, yeah, and, and as a supporter, so to say. So I thought it was really a lot of fun, the, the first hour on this, uh, this conference. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, yeah, so like, indeed, I will talk about the, the Reprohack initiative and a workshop that we held actually quite a while now uh, ago. But first, I would like to talk about what actually uh, the, the computational reproducibility, just to get the definitions uh, that I will use to get us on the same page. And I used this figure from the Turing Way a Handbook from Reproducible Data Science that I guess many of you uh, might know already, um, where we talk about a reproducible study when the analysis and the data are the same and the replicable study when the analysis is the same uh, but the data is different. Robustness comes from a different analysis on the same data and we generalize when you have a different analysis on a different data set. So reproducibility uh, just a sort of overview checklist to think about. Uh, also this coming from the, uh, the Turing way. 
and also from my own experience in reproducible uh, science, well, you need to have, of course, a, a research question or an abstract describing um, what you did. Your input data, metadata, uh, the tooling, the code, code documentation, and uh, the results. But what actually happens in practice, and now focusing a bit on the code here, and I found this very interesting blog by the PLOS Director of Open Research Solutions that was published uh, quite recently. And they asked their users, you know, why have you not shared your code publicly in the past? Select all that apply. And the top reason being that it takes too much time to prepare code for sharing. The second would be uh, the concerns with my ability to prepare the code for sharing. And then Oh, sorry. The second is the software and system dependencies. And the third is concerns with my ability to prepare the code for sharing. And uh, so we can see that, yeah, these are things that, um, that researchers nearly need to, uh, yeah, to, to, to practice upon. And, or oh, not only that, so how to really counter this? Well, award researchers for their reproducibility efforts, I guess will be talked about today maybe as well. That researchers are of course uh, judged mainly upon their outputs in terms of publications and not really on uh, the, you know, making a code available, for example. Another point, you know, start on time, data management plans are becoming common practice and research software plans are actually also starting to pop up, which is a really good thing, I think, since researchers are, uh, research software is not really the same as production software, it's usually made for a specific purpose, but still needs planning. And then you come to the core of my talk, which is about, you know, educate, 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 and an example about that, the, the repro hack. So how does a repro hack work? Well, researchers try to reproduce results reported by papers that have been submitted to the repro hack. And the idea is actually that it is a really a low pressure sandbox environment for practicing reproducible research practices. And as a participant that you learn, practice and uh, try out yourself as an author, uh, submitting a paper, you get feedback and acknowledgements for your efforts. And we, of course, hope that this will help uh, furthering science by increasing the skills for reviewing and producing reproducible research. And here I put down just an example reprohack schedule to make it a more concrete. So we held a reprohack uh, at in November 2019 in the library. <clears throat> we started with some, uh, you know, coffee and tea and welcome. It really took some time for that. And we really want to create this sort of warm, welcoming atmosphere uh, to help and not um, have this, not having a judgmental idea about, you know, how to reproduce things, uh, a paper, but just try to help each other and learning environment. We then started by a presentation about tools for reproducible research by Dr. Anna Cristalli this time. Um, we then started forming groups, started hacking, um, had some a very important time for lunch. Again, you know, uh, getting your blood sugar up to help you concentrate in front of the computer and also get to know people. We would then uh, continue hacking and they're having some break for another presentation, this time on a vision of open science beyond the reproducibility crisis by Dr. John Boy. Then we continued hacking and reported back with some drinks and bites. It's a short summary of the event. The, the setting was the Leiden University Library and the organization, the ReproHack core team of researchers and students with an active involvement from library support staff. We had 44 participants and they were from diverse backgrounds, psychology, engineering, biomedicine, computer science. 
We had 31 papers submitted to the ReproHack uh, and 19 were so, uh, ReproHacked and 11 were successfully or almost successfully uh, reproduced. So put down the link to the, to the paper here at the end if you wanna uh, check out some more statistics. Now, one important thing uh, coming out of this reaper hack was top 10 tips from the participants that um, um, yeah, that tried to re reproduce the papers. So they all have to fill out a form with uh, questions on, for example, you know, what did you think about the documentation and uh, what would you, how do you think it would improve and so forth. So the top 10 tips and as we mentioned, we're like, you know, package data so that it's easy and fast to download, provide non-platform specific code that is written using an open software, uh, use a code book explaining the data structure, include a readme text file to explain the context of data collection, comment the code generously, uh, perform a typo check, report on time needed to run the code, explain which parts of the code corresponds to which results in the paper, attach a permissive license to code and the permissive license uh, to data. And then I actually wanted to read this out. This is from, from the paper uh, that's in the ISIST quarterly uh, because I, it's really, I try to sort of, um, and transfer the feeling of like how libraries can, can make a, why libraries are such a great place to organize these things. So I would say, you know, the library as a place to meet and exchange ideas. So that libraries have always been a place for people to meet and exchange ideas. In a sense, they offer a neutral space outside research institutes for researchers to focus on subparts of work. Reaper hacks and other grassroots initiatives need exactly that, a place to meet, work, think, and discuss. Libraries are connected with the faculties and they can use their network to reach researchers throughout the university. For this first Reaper hack in the Netherlands, the CDS, that's the Center for Digital Scholarship in the library that I'm connected to, they contributed greatly by offering its infrastructure and enhancing the organizers' outreach through posters, flyers, and flyers and their uh, Twitter accounts. But also informing faculty liaisons to give them opportunity to spread the word via the channels as well. And next time, maybe some more directed advertisements can be made by informing participants taking part in other workshops organized by the Center for Digital Scholarship. And this reaper hack sparked discussions at other Dutch universities around organizing their own reaper hack. There are continuously reaper hacks being organized, um, and in the yeah in, in different places in the, definitely I know of in in Europe, and yeah it's um, wanted to say that well if you would like to organize your own reaper hack. Where can you then actually find help, inspiration, and support? And there is a GitHub on about the ReproHack headquarters and uh, organizing instructions. So there's a, like a, a template that you can follow to all the things you need to think about, the practical things, but also, uh, yeah, maybe do you need funding or, is it how do you reach participants? How do you get people to, to submit their papers and so forth? There's a Twitter account, uh, there's a Slack invite. The Reprac team has a Gmail address. And there is also, like I said, uh, this paper that we published last year in uh, ISC Quarterly. You can read for some for me inspiration. Um, also to say that yeah, the researchers are actually really the ones that are organizing these uh, repro hacks and we supported, we are actively involved. And um, yeah, it's a really nice collaboration that I hope more people would take up. And yeah, that's 
was actually uh, what I wanted to say uh, about this today. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think I will just stop sharing. Thank you so much, uh, Christina. Uh, if you have a question for Christina, just type it on the chat box. If not, I just have a quick question uh, for Christina while um, Sandra is setting up. Um, um, I noticed that there's a, a lunch buffet in the in the schedule. Is that uh, provided by your team? <laughs> No, no, sorry, it's uh, it's not, <laughs> but it's a great spirit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> in the spirit of the reprint. <laughs> All right. And then let's see, there's another question. Um, yes, these slides and links will be shared. I'm just answering your question. All right, uh, send, um, our next presenter is Sandra Sochak. Sandra is the user experience and engagement librarian and data services librarian at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. The title of her presentation is Computational Reproducibility, a Practical Framework for Data Curators. Sandra is passionate about research data management, digital humanities, and emerging technologies. She is currently involved in a grant-funded research project to digitize and make accessible Canada's historic census records. Sandra? Hello, thank you. Um, and thank you, Christina. Presentations like yours are exactly why I attend iAssist. I think that the repro hack is a, such a neat idea. So thank you so much um, for your presentation and you've given me lots of ideas. Um, about my own practice, so this is great. Uh, I'm here to continue the conversation about computational reproducibility. So uh, my co-presenter, uh, Shahira Carr, uh, who is presenting uh, at another session, I think at, uh, in ISIS, so um, she's wonderful. She's from the University of Victoria. Her and I uh, presented this framework at the Canadian Data Curation Forum that was held um, what feels like a lifetime ago uh, in Hamilton. And I honestly can't remember if it was 2018 or 2019. Um, all of the years are, are the same to me now. But, um, you know, through a portage expert group called uh, the Curation Expert Sandra, Group. Sandra, we're not seeing um, your slides. Okay. Um, I, what are you seeing? This, I we feel like I practiced this. So mm -hmm. let me see here. Is this the screen that you, uh, are you seeing a slide? Yeah, now we can see it. Yep. Okay, wonderful. I wanted to use my notes, but we're just gonna go without the notes. Um, so you can see there the name of my uh, co-presenter who is presenting at another session, I think. Um, so we created this workshop for the Canadian Data Curation Forum a couple of years ago. And uh, we have this webpage that we created as well to support some of the work um, and some of the experiments that we did. So there's actually some reproducible data sets uh, that we have put into our GitHub. There is a bigger version of the slides there um, from what I have to present today. And there's you know, a reference list. So I highly recommend uh, if you are interested in any of this that you visit the page because it's really an expanded kind of version of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, we have already talked a little bit about what is reproducibility, um, but what I want to talk to first is what isn't reproducibility, and uh, Christina mentioned this in her presentation. Um, so there's a difference between reproducible and replicable, and replicable is using new data with the same methods to get the same results. So replicability uh, is great, but it's more difficult. Um, than reproducibility um, because the experiment needs to be arranged in such a way that new data can be, you know, um, kind of injected in there and for everything to work in the same way. So I'm not talking today about replicability. Um, rather, I'm talking about reproducibility. So reproducibility is using the same data 
uh, the same methods and obtaining the same results. Um, and that would be great if we could inspire more people to uh, design experiments to um, have some reproducible results. Now I'm speaking to you today as a librarian because librarians are, are going to be um, tasked more and more with assessing data sets and assessing um, entire kind of curatorial packages for um, you know deposit into repositories. And the thing with us as librarians is that we're not necessarily going to be have subject matter expertise in all of the areas in which we may need to um, review. So it's important for us, I think, to understand concepts in computation um, and, and reproducibility, but not necessarily to be experts, not even coding experts. I mean, I really enjoy it, but um, not everybody needs to have this intense uh, coding literacy in order to be able to act as a curator um, for research projects. And I really want to just stress that uh, throughout the presentation. One of the issues why um, reproducibility can be difficult is because there are different types of reproducibility. So while I'm talking today about computation, um, we can see here that there are other forms of reproducibility uh, that are you know, just as important. But today we're talking about the computational. Basically, computational reproducibility involves the ability to reuse the assets used to derive the hypothesis and the results. Um, and this includes stuff like the input data, the source code um, that was used to uh, you know, create the results. Maybe that's R or Python. Um, maybe that's a, a software environment like SPSS. Um, and then the computing environment, which is the entire uh, machine that you use to run the experiment, for example, I'm using a Mac right now. Um, you might be using a PC or you might be running something on Linux. You might be doing your experiments in a cloud computing uh, situation like we have in Canada called Compute Canada, where we have this shared infrastructure um, for computing. So this computing environment is also uh, a really crucial to know about when we're talking about uh, reproducing experiments. It's not just enough to have the code or to have the data. Uh, there are so many other details that we need. Um, I love to share this quote about computational science. I mean, really uh, the scholarship when we're using computational methods um, when we publish a paper, we're really kind of advertising the scholarship and we're not really sharing the scholarship itself because it involves um, so much complexity. Uh, there's so much going on in the back end um, that gets us to where we're going. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to kind of like wrap your head around um, this notion that uh, when we publish, we're just kind of describing the scholarship uh, in some ways, and some people may disagree with this. Um, but the fact is that a lot of researchers are not formally trained as programmers, and, and we saw this great um, chart in Christina's presentation, sharing some of the reasons why people don't share their code uh, and, and uh, share their experiments. And, and many of the reasons are, to do with the, the researchers feel that the code maybe isn't good enough or cleaned up enough or polished enough to share. Um, and, you know, this is true. And I find that this is true for myself uh, that probably a lot of researchers feel that way. And if you are acting as a researcher um, and using code and, and maybe feeling like uh, not an expert, I think that. Uh, most of us are feeling that way. And how many times do I look at Stack Overflow uh, to do the most simple thing that I've done a hundred times uh, when I'm using Python or even using Excel? Um, 
I would love to know, and you can put in the chat, if you have ever tried to reproduce your own or someone else's results, uh, I can speak to that very clearly for the exercises that I created for the Canadian Data Curation Forum. Um, and it was very difficult. But we have to understand that reproducibility is a spectrum and perfection is the enemy of good here. Um, in fact, uh, studies can be kind of reproducible, you know, in the middle where the code and data and the computational environment is there and uh, reusers are able to put those things together and reuse and rerun the code uh, with a little bit of work. And depending on, um, you know, if you like that kind of thing or not, it can be really, really fun. And I'm gonna uh, share a little bit of that with you uh, when we take a look at some of the extra resources that we have available. But it's important to understand that sharing does not mean reproducible. So just sharing your code in a repository um, does not mean that it is reproducible. Uh, you know, there are many things to consider and uh, the reason why I'm presenting to you today and the reason that I love to present in ISS is because I have something to share with you about reproducibility. So my colleague Shahira and I um, have created uh, a framework for reproducibility. And this framework is available for you to use. Um, we've put a CC0 license on it. So you can take it and not credit us and make it better and use it in your practice. And that's totally great. Um, but this framework can be used by a curator uh, with perhaps a lower understanding of, um, you know, uh, computation and, and uh, coding to really go through and make some decisions about uh, what is in the research project, uh, maybe what needs to be done or what can be approved upon by the researcher if a curator has a chance to see the researcher. Um, and by going through the framework itself, it's actually a really good way to learn about reproducibility um, because that's the thing. Learning about reproducibility is helping researchers to become, you know, better at reproducibility. And as we all go through this together um, and develop our skills, things will become easier and things will get um, more and more reproducible. So I wanna say not to be afraid of, um, you know, looking at things that, uh, and different kinds of data types that um, one might not be too familiar with because, you know, speaking to the librarians in the audience, we're librarians and we always just figure it out. Um, and this is just one of those things that, that we can figure out. So the first kind of area of uh, creating data sets that can be more reproducible uh, is in the organization of the files, looking at file names, directory structures, versioning, um, and of course the readme file is really key to uh, enhancing reproducibility. So having, you know, almost a, like a literary description of what is happening um, with the project can be really, really helpful uh, when that project needs to be deposited. Documentation, um, such as information about dependencies, uh, you know, relative paths, uh, you know, code execution and decisions around cleaning. I mean, how many times uh, in your own practice, do you do a number of kind of cleaning steps on a data set without documenting that? I mean, I can speak to a, a ton of work that I've done recently uh, with no documentation at all on the data cleaning. Luckily, I used Open Refine, which gives me a history of that. But still, those kinds of decisions can be really helpful. Data documentation, information about the raw data itself, um, you know, information about the formats of the raw data and the types of programs, data dictionaries, etc. Um, and finally, licenses. Licenses are so important in this area of computational reproducibility. Um, is there a license for the software? Is there a license for the data? Um, all of these things are tremendously important. 
Um, so I invite you to share uh, that reproducibility framework um, with your colleagues. Uh, please use it, um, build on it, uh, help it grow, and um, you know, use it as a learning tool to uh, to further your practice in reproducibility um, at your own institutions. And again. Um, definitely check out uh, the small web page that we made because there's some hands-on activities in there that you can actually uh, go through and um, do a lot of fun stuff on some existing data sets. And I'll put that web page in the chat. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, uh, Sandra. Um, if you have a question for Sandra, please go ahead and uh, type in your a uh, question in the chat box or the Q&A. While our next presenter is uh, preparing for a presentation. All right, there are no questions for uh, Sandra at the moment. So leave, uh, reserve your questions uh, for the Q&A. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Cheryl A. Thompson. Cheryl is a research data archivist at the Odom Institute for Research in Social Sciences at University of North Carolina. The title of her presentation is Computational Reproducibility, Examining Verification Errors and Frictions. Cheryl's research focuses on information infrastructure, specifically how to build and sustain data services, workforces, and tools capable of supporting scientific integrity and data preservation. As an archivist, Cheryl hopes to promote the trustworthiness of science through better data sharing, transparency of practice, and responsive education. Cheryl? Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to present um, our research today on verification errors. Um, I want to acknowledge my co author, my Christian. She's not presenting today, but she's been instrumental um, in this whole research project. Uh, and she is here at ISIS, so you should find her later. So this presentation will briefly describe the research project on the computational reproducibility errors, um, our study design, the key results, and some implications for research reproducibility services that I hope will contribute to a fruitful discussion later. But given the format, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. So please ask questions um, in the discussion or email me later. Let's see. Oh, I'm trying to advance my slide. I guess I got to use the mouse. Okay, so a distinct a distinction of today's research landscape is this increasing demand for reproducible research. And just to make sure we're on the same page, it sort of follows a lot of what the two presentations have um, been spoken to. But I use Victoria Stodden's definition of computational research that you take the same data and code um, and you try to get the same results. Um, but in terms of my experiences, I would say that we really need to extend this definition broader than just data and code. And this is where I like the NASM report because they talk about transparency. Um, because I find in my work, uh, we need to know, we need more documentation, we need some more research materials to really help us interpret the data and the files and to sort of understand the computational approaches that somebody took. So in the political science community, there's really been an ongoing debate for the past 20 plus years about a computational reproducibility standard. And in response to this debate in 2015, the American Journal of Political Science adopted a verification policy where authors whose manuscripts have received conditional acceptance for publication must provide their research materials that are required to verify their results. And publication in AJPS is contingent on passing verification. And AJPS has contracted with third parties to conduct the verification checks. For the quantitative analyses, the verification process is carried out by the Odom Institute. For the qualitative analyses, verification is handled by the Qualitative Data Repository at Syracuse University. 
And our research really focused on the quantitative verification that we perform at Odom. So just to give you a little bit of context, I wanted to just sort of help you sort of have a high level sense of what a verification audit looks like and what we're looking for. So we see it as comprised of two workflows, the curation side and the verification side. So the curation workflow is really checking that the materials are complete, they're well documented, you can understand um, what's in the package and how to interpret it. Um, and the files are in formats that are preservation friendly or at least community standards. Then the verification workflows. Um, this is where our team of verifiers really inspect the code um, to ensure it's complete, it's well documented, it compiles and executes, and then they compare the outputs to the results in the manuscript. So we've performed this check on over 340 manuscripts. And so how are we doing? Right now, the average number of resubmissions is two. Um, and only a handful of manuscripts pass verification on the first submission. And we spend, in terms of staff time at Odom, we spend, a, we spend about six hours on each manuscript. Um, and I just want to note that um, these authors are really well intentioned and they're publishing in a high impact journal. And so they're often shocked that we cannot verify their results the first time. Um, and so what this tells me is that reproducibility um, is really challenging for researchers, um, especially trying to figure out what we need for verification and trying to anticipate the effects of moving the files from their environment into our um, environment. So our research question was really just simple. What are the challenges that authors face in complying with computational reproducibility policies? We conducted a close examination of the Odom AJPS verification tracking database, and we analyzed the database for considerations of errors and challenges that happen, happen during these verification checks. And we selected 105 manuscripts that fell under the same version of the AJPS policy. And so this was from late 2017 to early 2019. And we conducted um, iterative coding on these verification reports uh, for the manuscripts to understand the types of errors um, that we're seeing. So just very quickly, a little bit about our sample. Um, on average, the manuscripts took about two resubmissions uh, in order to pass verification in the sample, and also only two manuscripts passed verification the first time in this sample. And so this is sort of similar to the whole population of um, completed AJPS um, manuscripts that we have. So this analysis generated a set of verification error categories that I think are really important when we talk about how to support reproducible science um, in developing services. The error analysis, as I said, used iterative coding of the curation and the verification issues and the challenges that the curators and the verifiers experience to identify the 21 distinct types of errors. And these 21 types of errors are associated with the seven categories on this slide. Um, and these categories really draw from just multiple dimensions of the research process. And so these are the 21 types. And don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all of them right now because I don't have time. But um, I just wanted to show you sort of um, the types of errors that our research produced. Um, and this table is ordered in terms of um, the top the documentation, the ones at the top of the table, these are ones that were the most frequently occurring in this sample. And then the bottom of the table, the modeling errors um, were the ones that we saw the least. Um, and so I'm going to just talk about the documentation category, the coding category, and the technology categories for this talk. Okay, so I wanted to drill down into the documentation category. Um, just because it was um, the predominant errors in this sample. And often these documentation errors persist across resubmissions for many of our manuscripts. So it's taking them, the authors a while to figure out what exactly it is we need. Um, and so for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into great detail on each of the types, but the category had three error types that revolved around the data file and the structure, um, also how the variables were set up, 
the overall verification package and the relationships between some of the files in the package and just other aspects of the research that were just really important for understanding sort of the context or how to interpret and use these research materials. Um, and so the errors in this category really illustrate, at least to me, the challenges that our authors face in trying to provide enough information, but also the right information to support reproductions by others. So I selected coding as the other category because it was the second most frequent error in the sample. Um, and I think it actually resonates a, a lot with what Christina was talking about in her slide on the coding issues. So this category encompassed four types of errors. Uh, there was incomplete scripts, so we just didn't get everything. Um, authors often used absolute file paths and not relative file paths, so which created portability issues in terms of um, moving it into a new environment. Uh, the code would just not execute and we couldn't figure out the reason. Um, and then there was also just, um, although often our verifiers were very unclear about what the code was doing or code blocks were doing because there just wasn't enough documentation in the code to understand. Um, and so the coding categories highlight the importance of both the executable commands, but also with some non-executable comments. So you can really understand the computational approach and the steps that are taken in the code. Um, it also reflects some of the challenges in terms of code portability when you're transferring these, the code files out of the author's infrastructure and into ours for verification. You know, information's missing, not everything's packaged up together. We have different file structures and systems, um, and so these are sort of creating errors as well. So the final error category that I'm going to talk about is technologies. Um, and this was a category that represents an error that often persisted across resubmissions for authors um, when, uh, when they experienced it. So uh, this involved three error types. Uh, and the first one uh, was around understanding the author's compute environment, um, just the software, the packages, and the dependencies. Um, so we could build a similar environment for verification. Um, and when I, you know, I talk about the compute environment, um, this type is really the things that are under the author's control, that they just had to give us the right specs. So what version of R are you running? What versions of the packages do you have loaded? Um, but then there was another set of categories um, that was around the platforms and the constraints they were using or um, encoding standards that are sort of built into the technologies they're using. Um, and these are not so much under the author's controls, they're just sort of products of, you know, the systems that they're using. And so the research and verification work are supported by these sets of technologies, but often we're, you know, these platforms have their own limitations and sort of special requirements. And so um, in this era category, we're sort of seeing the challenges and trying to get the um, computer environment and the technologies right so we can um, do reproductions. Okay, so in thinking about the implications of our results, it really illuminated um, some underlying frictions that are happening um, when you think about verification policies and contrast them with the practices of researchers. And so when I say frictions, I'm sort of in a Paul Edwards sense, you know, that there's these situations in which data and code reuse and sharing of verification are problematic in relation to the everyday practices of researchers. And I'm just going to go through a few of these for the sake of time. Um, but the first one is just data sharing. So researchers think about data as a means to knowledge production. So it's the thing that, you know, they use to learn things and make discoveries, um, but they're not sort of making it the final product. The final product is the manuscript. Um, but these verification policies and data sharing policies, data is now a first class product. It's the final product um, that people will be reusing and you know people will be evaluated on them. And so I think there's sort of a disconnect there where you know researchers aren't really interested in um, creating the high quality, well-documented products um, that uh, it takes to be shared. Uh, the other th uh, thing I wanted to highlight was some temporal issues that a lot of these errors um, could be solved by uh, better practices, like in terms of documentation data or coding practices, if they were implemented earlier in the life cycle. Because for a lot of our researchers, they're doing verification at the very end. And so they're struggling to pull everything together that they've been doing for the last year, um, but they're doing it right at the time of publication. 
Hmm. Okay, and so I think it's important to be aware of some of these frictions as we design our services. And so just really quickly, um, this analysis brought up some additional questions. Uh, so we want to do some modeling to understand which types of errors lead to longer verification times, because we think this could really help us target um, which errors uh, to target in terms of our services uh, that if we want to really reduce the time to verification. Uh, we're also using these results to help inform guidance for authors that go through the AJPS verification audit, as well as to design trainings um, for computational reproducibility and how to um, package up your work for verification. Um, and so just since I'm running out of time, I um, thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions in the discussion period. Stop sharing. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. So we have a question from Bell Lipton. Uh, what was unique about the researchers who passed the first time, uh, do you know? You know, if we had the answer to that, I think we could just solve this completely. <laughs> you know, I did look to see if any of them had been through the process before, um, and, and they hadn't. Um, but in terms of the quality of what they gave us, um, I would say, you know, it was obvious that we got everything. and. Um, it was actually obvious that they reran their code, I think. I think they reran it before they gave it to us and they were able to see that it, um, you know, what was missing um, or um, what needed to be tweaked, you know, in terms of the packages and the versions. I think that's a key piece. And that's actually something that we've implemented recently that we're asked, or in the last year, that we're asking authors to rerun their code and show us a log file before they submit it to us to show us that they got the results from these files. Okay, thank you. Now there's a question from uh, Irina. Uh, this is for Sandra and Christina. Uh, what is your experience in reproducing results when data and materials are saved in repository or archived uh, linked to publication? Um, I'll come in with that one. So that was actually the, uh, the project that I was, well, it wasn't a project, it was a workshop that I was working on. So I um, used some data from PISA, which is, uh, you know, educational, global educational data. And um, it was very difficult to uh, just take their data from their repository, look at the paper, you know, they had, they had created uh, a GitHub, um, I forked it, um, it was very difficult. So even well-documented, uh, well-described and well-organized data, uh, it can be very difficult to reproduce. Um, and in my experience, it is because of the dependencies in the computing environments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unless you're running things um, kind of uh, in something like a, a binder program. So, uh, you, know, you know, a virtual environment or in a virtual machine, uh, you basically need to install, uh, depending on the code package, everything on your machine and get everything running on your machine um, to prevent any errors. And uh, a really good solution to that is by encapsulating everything in a virtual machine. Um, uh, like my binder or someone mentioned uh, in the chat, ReproZip, something that will tie everything together in a package so that uh, there's not a lot of mystery solving to be done. How about you, Christina? Yeah, I, yeah, I, uh, I, <laughs> I agree that, you know, if your goal is really to <clears throat> reproduce like, like, you know, everything then indeed a virtual machine, is uh, maybe the most logical uh, choice. But if you want to, mm, I think I have also had great experiences just downloading people's uh, code from a paper, from a repository and just running it actually. So it's, it, it is possible, but then they indeed have to uh, really say, you know, which version of R, for example, are you running? and. I agree. I mean, that is uh, that is the case. Um, although I have to say, it starts with repository sharing, right? So if it's not even there, <laughs> then it becomes very difficult. So 
uh, yeah, taking the step to go all the way, sort of, I think might be a big, big step uh, for for many researchers. But you know, making at least making your stuff available and making yourself available to answer the questions coming from uh, from researchers trying to use your your code and, and your data uh, is definitely a, a big step in the right direction. I mean, if I can just pop in again, one thing yeah. that we often forget, and it's, uh, you know, and Cheryl mentioned it perfectly, asking the researchers to rerun their own code. Um, often the data reusers are the researchers themselves. So having that built into the process, I think uh, would just be so, so helpful uh, going forward. So I thought that was a great suggestion, Cheryl. So we have actually a similar process in our results reproduction service where we have a post manuscript uh, writing uh, data quality review uh, where the researchers have to uh, go through the process of running their code again from start to finish after writing their manuscript uh, and compare the results uh, with, uh, with the manuscript just to ensure that the code works and that it's producing the, the, the same results uh, exactly as on the manuscript. All right, so we have another question. I believe this is uh, for uh, Cheryl. Uh, this question is from Paula. Do you, any of you accept advanced, or maybe for all of you, do any of you accept advanced stats undergrads to conduct reproducibility audits? We don't use undergrads. We use graduate students right now. We have master's and doctoral students um, who have taken um, their stats courses. Um, I do know the AEA, the Economics, American Economics Association, and their verification audit, they use undergrads as well as master's students. Um, okay. And then uh, there's a question from Abby Hamill uh, for both Sandra and Cheryl. Uh, how do you deal with computational reproducibility in SPSS or other point and click statistical programs? Um, I'll just pop in quickly to say that, you know, uh, commercial programs aren't always necessarily bad when it comes to reproducibility because they're so widely used and widely accepted. Uh, that it can actually be quite easy to output what is needed uh, for a reuser. So we're definitely not, um, you know, against commercial software uh, simply because so many people use it that it makes reusability um, easier than, you know, something that is a little more niche or perhaps code that is written by the researcher themselves. And I see Cheryl nodding. So um, <laughs> I'm sure you have something yeah, to yeah. ask. Yeah. Well, our authors use, um, it's R and Stata are the predominant choices. And actually Stata has really good backwards compatibility. So if I get an older Stata file, I can easily get it open. Um, and so that's really, you know, there are some perks to some of the proprietary um, software. Um, and I agree with your sentiment that we're, you know, well, it's great to use some of these more open source tools or command line. If your researchers are just not there, it's really hard to make them do that because we have some authors that I got their state of code in a word document, you know, and it's just, <laughs> so, you know, forcing them to do command line, like, you know, that these are just more, you know, it, it's not sort of where they are. Um, and so I think, you know, and even some things are still sort of hard to automate in the research process. And so we do ask for manual steps um, if they do manipulations to some of their figures, um, things like that. Uh, you know, we just ask that they tell us to be explicit, like, you know, you go this far with the code and then these are the changes I made to the image. Um, so. Maybe, maybe yeah. I could add to that as well, that there are some, I mean, uh, I don't do reproducibility. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not a reproducibility librarian in that sense that I verify uh, studies. So, I mean, you have much more experience in that, but I know uh, many commercial software in, in general, they more and more start to have like export in a interoperability format files, right? So, I mean, that uh, is also a way to go, I guess. 
And I think the yeah, more funder kind of demands and journal demands for data and reproducible or partially reproducible data, the more the proprietary software companies will be baking these features into their programs because the researchers will be requiring them. So it's it's one of these things that I think will just happen naturally as, as more funding agencies sign on um, to requiring data deposits. All right, it's already 1.55 p.m. and we promised that uh, we're going to end at 1.55 p.m. Uh, there's a say that all good things must come to an end. Uh, it's, it's time to close our session. Uh, thank you to the panelists for the wonderful presentations. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining our session today. I'll request the, our panelists to uh, answer our, the questions that are on the q and if possible. Um, uh, looking forward to seeing you all in other uh, virtual sessions. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.